Hello, everybody, and welcome to the National Maritime Historical Society's uh, seminar series. My name is Jessica McFarlane, and I'm going to be your Zoom host for this morning. Uh, I'm just getting to see a so many of you. It's really nice to see some familiar faces and also some new faces as well. Uh, I want to say thank you for joining us. Um, we're so pleased today to welcome three very special speakers with us. We have author and historian Jerry Roberts. We have Whit Perry, who's the Director of Maritime Preservation and Operations over at Plymouth Patuxent Museum. And of course, we have Quentin Snedeker, who is the Curator of Watercraft, Senior Curator for Watercraft over at Mystic Seaport Museum. So we're pleased to have you all here today. Um, before I introduce our Sea History Editor, Deirdre O'Regan, who's going to be moderating for us today, um, allow me to just tell you a little bit about the format for today's presentation. It's going to be sort of similar to those seminars that we've had in the past, but a bit different, of course. Um, Jerry, Witt, and Quentin will each speak for about 10 minutes, and they will be having a presentation on your screens. Um, after that, we will go into a Q&A session. They'll be able to ask each other some questions, and then we'll take some uh, questions as well from the audience. And if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat feature. Uh, we also want to say thank you for all of the people that submitted questions upon registration. They were um, really interesting and insightful, and we're looking forward to addressing some of them today. And you have probably noticed that um, uh, for everybody's benefit uh, in terms of speaking and, and audio quality today, we've muted everybody. We're sorry about that, but um, we want to make sure that everybody hears uh, every single word that our speakers have for us today. Um, so without further ado, I would like to go ahead and uh, introduce Deirdre O'Regan. Go ahead, Deirdre. Good morning, everybody. Um, on a beautiful, at least in uh, the Northeast, it's a, a beautiful day to go out and not go sailing. Anyway. Um, we have three uh, speakers with us today. Um, first off will be Jerry Roberts, who's a historian and a long career in maritime museums, uh, long well known to the National Maritime Historical Society, and the recent author of uh, an article we ran in two issues ago called The Mayflower Factor, um, researching the maritime history of the Mayflower voyage and uh, particularly its ramifications uh, and legacy long after uh, that era, that generation was done. I was uh, pretty um, amazed when the article ran how many people contacted us about that they were descendants of Mayflower uh, passengers or crew. And um, apparently there, there's supposedly 10 million living Americans who claim direct lineage to a Mayflower uh, ship's personnel. And um, I just was pretty surprised how many of them are actively involved in either organizations or personal research about that. And Jerry can enlighten us about those things. Um, after Jerry will be Whit Perry, who's the captain of the Mayflower too. And uh, he has a long title at the Plymouth Patuxent Museum, which I'll let him give that to you yourself, Whit, when the time comes. Uh, Whit, and uh, moved to Mystic Seaport for uh, a couple of years while the Mayflower was being restored at the Mystic Seaport's Henry DuPont Preservation Shipyard. I think I got that right or close to it. Um, and he worked side by side with Quentin Snedeker in the full uh, restoration of the vessel, which in itself has become a historic vessel. We're in an era where some of our replica ships are getting old enough and have their own stories to tell that they are becoming historic ships in their own right. So it has a dual role in representing its history as a museum ship and, uh, and representing the history of the original Mayflower. Um, so, and then of course, we'll hear from Quentin as well about the, the restoration project and its challenges, its joys, but without uh, going on and on about me talking about them, I'll let them speak for themselves. So uh, Jerry Roberts, you're up first and here we go. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. See how that works. And okay, does that, does that work? Yeah. That looks great, Jerry. Yeah. Great. So I'm not gonna talk a lot about the ship itself because we have two <laughs> people who know a heck of a lot more about the ship than I do. 
Um, but uh, I'm going to talk about a general overview, a sort of a Pilgrim's 101. First of all, I wanted to talk about resources because people are always asking me, where can they learn more? And we'll make sure that through National Maritime, anybody who wants this list of resources can get them. Um, can folks see my pointer on the screen? Yes. yes. So the Holy Grail is uh, of Plymouth Plantation, which was written by uh, William Bradford, who was the governor of, of, uh, of Plymouth Colony for so long. Uh, he is acknowledged as America's first um, written word historian. And I'm, I'm not trying to diminish the oral history of the native peoples. I'm talking about our written history sort of begins with Plymouth Plantation. So that's the Holy Grail. Uh, then there's a series of other along the top here. These are firsthand accounts. These are written by Mayflower pilgrims themselves or people that lived in the colony within uh, a few years of arrival. So this top row is really what you wanna learn if you wanna get the word from the folks directly. The bottom row, I will tell you if I were gonna buy one book about the pilgrim experience, it would be 111 questions and answers concerning the pilgrims. This is my Bible and it's short and sweet as far as uh, being able to find the information, but it's amazing. Of course, you've got Nathaniel Philbrook's Mayflower. Now, some traditional historians accuse him of being a pop culture historian. I personally think um, that just means it's easy to read, and, and it is. Uh, it's, it's a great story, and he has a companion book that goes along with it. And lastly, because I saw some people asking this morning about their own particular Mayflower ancestors, um, Caleb Johnson uh, has written a, a series of books about the Mayflower, and one of them is the Mayflower and her passengers. And he has researched every single person aboard the Mayflower. Now, unfortunately, all of the crewmen have not been identified, but every passenger has been. And so this book will tell you your, your uh, ancestor's story. Uh, why am I not being able to uh, advance my slides? Let's see. There we go. Organizations. Pilgrim Hall is the oldest uh, a continuously operating public museum in the country, and it holds the Mayflower artifacts, uh, the hats, the guns, the baskets, the chairs. It also holds um, you know, centuries worth of paintings done about the Mayflower, some of them very inaccurate, which they point out, and others more so. So it's worth seeing. It's right there in Plymouth. The General Society of Mayflower Descendants, which most people call the Mayflower Society, they are the genealogical organization that registers um, the authenticity of claims. Uh, then what used to be called Plymouth Plantation is now being called Plymouth Patoxet Museums uh, is amazing. If you haven't been there, you have to go. It's the re recreated village and Mayflower too. And then several families have organizations. The largest are the, uh, the Alden Kindred, which has a historic Alden house in Duxbury and the John Holland Society who has a historic house right there in in Plymouth. Um, if you haven't been to uh, Plymouth Plantation, you really need to go and of course see the Mayflower too. It's an extraordinary, not just a museum, a way to step back, but you get to talk to real folks, um, both Native American and uh, colonial reenactors, and it's just a great experience. So most of us have a preconceived notion. I think many of us are probably of an older generation who remember Thanksgiving in a very Norman Rockwell setting um, and, and, and the Mayflower experience was wrapped up in that. And we know now that it isn't uh, is, is authentic as we thought it was. Because there's another side of the story, of course. It's the Native Americans who were in this country before the Europeans arrived and they have a story to tell and thank goodness they're finally getting a chance to tell it. So whose story really is this? Um, you know, it, does it belong to the pilgrim? Does it belong to the pilgrim ancestors? Does it belong to the Native Americans? Does it belong to every single American? And that's a, a question that is really, it's a timely thing to ask. These two photographs, I'm gonna talk about them later, about what these kids have in common. And I can tell you the ones on the left, that picture was taken right in Plymouth next to the William Bradford statue. And the other two kids, that picture was taken some years ago in Kingston, Jamaica. So who are the pilgrims? And someone asked this in the, the pre-applied uh, pre, uh, questions. Were the, were the pilgrims uh, Puritans? Well, so real quick, as quick as I can do this, because it's complicated. So Puritans were people that believed that the Church of England, the established church uh, run by uh, the, the king in effect, instead of a pope, 
had gotten way too much, way too top heavy, way too much into dogma, much like the Catholic Church, much more about cardinals and, and bishops and so forth. And they believed that the church needed to be purified, but they believed they could purify it from within. So they stayed in the church and tried their hardest to purify it. The separatists had gone beyond that. They figured, you know, we cannot purify this church. We need to separate from the church. And of course, separating from the Church of England meant separating from the crown, and uh, it was hard. And so a large group of them moved to Leiden, Holland, where they set up their own um, sort of exiled colony. Now, they still felt very English. They loved England, uh, but they wanted to worship their own way. Strangers. So when the separatists finally decided to leave Holland to try to form their own colony in the, the New World, uh, the people that invested, the merchant adventurers who invested money in, in the program, wanted to sort of pad their bet and add some more colonists. And they added the group of people from, from the London area who were not necessarily um, separatists. They just wanted a new start in the new world. And so they're called the strangers in, in some texts. But together, the separatists and the strangers are what we now call the pilgrims, not to be confused with the Puritans, who came over in massive numbers 10 years later and settled the area that became Boston. So after arranging for to buy a ship called the Speedwell, the Leiden, um, the Leiden separatists um, went to uh, England where they had leased a ship, the Merchant Adventures had leased a ship called the Mayflower that would take the, uh, the, the separatists and the additional colonists to America, which was already somewhat not widely established, but of course there was Jamestown, the Dutch were there. It was not an unknown commodity, but it was a place where they felt they could start over afresh. So getting over wasn't very easy. Um, they actually, it took three tries. Um, they departed first on August 5th with the Speedwell and the Mayflower. Unfortunately, the Speedwell had problems. They had to turn back. Um, they uh, turned back to Dartmouth. They left Dartmouth again in August 23. Again, the Speedwell had problems. They had to turn back. Finally, on September 6, from Plymouth, the Mayflower departed with all of the passengers crammed aboard. They'd given up on the Speedwell, which was meant to stay with the colonists, by the way. So now they had they did not have their own ship anymore. They had a leased vessel, if you will. It was a rough crossing. It took 66 days. They encountered gales and storms, and it was uh, clearly a very difficult situation. A man actually went overboard. We're gonna talk about that a bit later. They arrived November 9th off of Cape Cod. Um, this was quite a bit further north than they wanted to be. They tried to sail around Cape Cod, but uh, it just didn't work out, the, 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 the tides and the currents. So they turned back um, to go to, to inside of Cape Cod. So they were meant to go to, Plym I, I'm sorry, they were meant to go to just beneath uh, New York. Uh, this was still part of the Virginia colony, that blue line, the 41 parallel. Uh, they were supposed to be in this area where they would be close enough to other English uh, settlements, actually Jamestown, and close enough to the Dutch settlement in New York that they would have some, uh, some communication with Europeans. They weren't arriving in the middle of nowhere. But when they had to land in Plymouth instead, they were, uh, from a European perspective, in the middle of nowhere. So they uh, got in behind what is now Provincetown. They, answered, they anchored there. And they were in the middle of uh, a land that was occupied by native peoples, mostly the Wampanoags, who had themselves just gone through a devastating experience. Uh, uh, sickness disease brought by early Europeans had, had really decimated uh, the Wampanoags. Um, so they were not in great shape. Because the pilgrims landed where there was not a government established, they, they landed outside of their designated grant. They did this uh, Mayflower Compact, which is where most all of the, the white men on the ship, they were, they were all white men, most of the men on the ship, I'm saying, signed this document um, of self-government and is now considered along with the Magna Carta and the US Constitution as one of the three primary documents of modern self-rule. They spent uh, a couple of weeks, actually they spent a month exploring the inside of Cape Cod Bay. They had um, some difficult 
adventures. They, they, they came across some um, uh, indigenous people who weren't real pleased with, with these uh, Europeans poking around, stealing some corn, molesting some graves. Uh, it wasn't a great experience. And these men that were going ashore in a small boat and then wading ashore in their heavy wool clothing in December, you could imagine how many of them uh, became uh, compromised from, from the weather. At last, um, they discovered across the bay a better place, a protected cove, and they moved the ship across uh, on December um, 15th and 16th. And December 19th is when we, we associate with the, them officially coming ashore. Now, these are paintings done a long time ago. They were romanticized. That's not even what they really looked like back then. There were no big hunks of rock like that. And although Plymouth Rock was actually there somewhere buried in the sand, we have no firsthand indication that they ever saw it, noticed it, cared about it, or stepped on it. That was uh, something that was uh, introduced later on. But they did come ashore. The first winter was extremely hard. Of course, it was very cold. These folks had hoped to arrive sometime in the summer. They were hoped to arrive in an area that had other Europeans nearby. Uh, they thought that by winter they would have had an established uh, uh, shore uh, facilities with, with structures and, and warmth and everything, but they didn't. Um, they had to start building homes in the middle of December. So of the 102 Mayflower passengers that, that arrived, um, the first three months took their toll from exposure, from exhaustion, from fever, from malnutrition, um, you, you can just imagine how difficult it was. Now look at all these families here. And now three months later, those ghost images are the people that were lost in the first three months. And some entire families were wiped out. Some, only a couple of families uh, remained intact. So it was a devastated uh, uh, group of people that got through that winter, 51 survivors out of 102 passengers. The game changer came in March when um, they made positive contact with the local natives. First Samosat uh, came into the village. He had uh, spent time in Maine with, with European fishermen. He knew some English. He actually walked into the village and, and welcomed them in English, which shocked them. Uh, a couple of weeks later, Squanto, who had been uh, abducted and taken to Europe um, and now returned, brought uh, Chief Massasoit, who was the chief of the Wampanoags, uh, Massasoit is really the guy who could have either let them die or destroy them, or instead worked out a, a treaty that was mutually beneficial, but really lasted about 50 years. So it gave the Mayflower uh, settlers a chance to become viable. So Coles Hill is uh, a hill overlooking the harbor, and there's Plymouth Rock structure there. There's the statue of Massasoit. Plymouth is a city filled with monuments, monuments to the Pilgrim Mothers, monuments to Massasoit, Pilgrim Hall Museum, the Mayflower Society, Mayflower II, the Founders Memorial, all kinds of great um, statues there. To me, the most poignant statue is, is, is this thing that looks like a sarcophagus up on top of Coles Hill. It actually is a sarcophagus. Inside are buried the bones of some of the very earliest folks who died, some of those 51, uh, before the official burial ground was established later. So this box has 51 names on it, the 51 who didn't make it. Of the 51 who did survive, only 28 produced offspring. But they would change the world. Because today there's more than 10 million Americans are direct descendant from one or more of those 28 people. That's one out of every 33 Americans is a direct descendant. So you, when you walk into a restaurant and someone says, I'm a Mayflower descendant, it's, it's easy to say, yeah, you're full of, you're full of wind. No, there's, they got a 33% chance of being so. If you live in the Plymouth area, you might be higher. Some folks say that there's 30 million Americans descendant, but the conservative accepted uh, number is 10 million. And of course, amongst those are some pretty amazing people. Um, I'm not going to name everyone. You recognize some of these faces. Some of these are entertainers. Some of these are writers. Some of these are adventurers and explorers. You've got Alan Shepard, uh, Amelia Earhart. Of course, you've got some amazing presidents and world leaders uh, from the beginning of our country right through to modern times. 
So some quick generational math. Um, I'm taking a theoretical Mayflower descendant born in 1954. Okay, all of us have two parents, four grandparents, eight great grandparents, 16 second great grandparents, and it goes on. By the time you get down to William Bradford, as related to this theoretical person built, born in 1954, there are 2,048 great grandparents. That's a lot of folks. That really shows you there's a lot of people in your family tree. I don't know how many of you have explored your family tree or how high you've climbed up in there, but family trees are vast. This is a traditional one. This is more poignant to me. This is called a fan tree. And starting with your name here, and then your parents and their parents, this goes out 10 generations. Well, at 10 generations, this, this list of names that could be filled in along here is 512. If you go out to 12 generations, which as you recall, would be someone born in 54, going back to William Bradford, 12 generations, that's 2,048. How many of these people in your family tree do you know? I bet you don't know any of them. Now, if you're related to William Bradford or another Mayflower person or somebody else, Paul Revere, you might know their name, but I bet you don't know the thousands or 2,000 other names in your family tree. And so when someone comes to me and says, oh, nothing important ever happened in my family, well, you just haven't climbed your tree high enough or searched around those branches. So what if some of those people that died had lived? That represents potentially millions of Americans who never existed, stories that were never written. What if a couple of them had died? A couple on the survivor list had actually not survived. Would it really made any difference to us today? Well, a fellow named John Howland fell overboard in the middle of the Atlantic. Now, Harry Potter, they say he's the boy who lived. John Howland is the man who should have died. A man who falls off the Mayflower, the only ship in the North Atlantic, should have drowned, right? But he caught a rope, a couple of crewmen poured him, pulled him aboard, and he survived. If he had not survived, these two men would never have been born. Imagine the 20th century, imagine World War II without Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. So that shows you, does the, does the Mayflower have an impact still today? Sure, sure does. What about these two kids? Again, what do they have in common? These two groups of kids. Well, this woman up here is my older sister. And in the 1960s, she married a Jamaican banker and she lived her life in Jamaica and had her children. This is her daughter, Nicole. This is Nicole today and her family in Miami. But they are just as much Mayflower descendants as my children, because if William Bradford had died that first winter, as he probably should have, he was very sick and he was in a building that caught fire, but somehow he lived. If he had died, the entire 12 generations leading to me and the 13 generations leading to my children would never have been born. So that's how real the Mayflower story is in my case, and I hope my kids understand that. But I wanted to make it clear that these kids are just as Mayflower descendants as these kids. There was a great um, article came out a few years back in, in USA uh, Weekend um, featuring this story that because of these 14 to 16 generations, uh, you've got Americans that are, have no idea they're Mayflower descendants. In fact, the Mayflower Society has only registered 95,000 descendants are registered, but we know that there's over 10 million living now, and that's conservative. So again, whose story is this? It belongs to all of us. It belongs to the Native Americans, the people that were here before we got here. It belongs to the African Americans who were brought over against their will. It belongs to people who came from Ireland, from Italy, from Eastern Europe, from all over the world to this country and fought hard to get here, every family, every family has its own Mayflower story. It may be the Mayflower in some families. In other families, that Mayflower is not that ship. It's a different kind of Mayflower. It's a slave ship. It's a ship coming into Ellis Island. Uh, it's just any number of vessels that came you know, even the fortune came just a few years after the Mayflower. 
So Europeans started arriving and coming in in large numbers. What I wanna make clear to people is this is not an elitist little story that belongs to a few people and the Mayflower Society in some ivory tower. It's an American story of immigration that continues, of melting pots, of still preserving our cultures, but respecting other people's cultures. And I think a great challenge that we have telling the Mayflower story is how to keep this relevant uh, to today. And so why should modern people care? Well, there's at least 10 million reasons they should care, uh, probably a lot more. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I went ahead, uh, thanks Jerry, that was fantastic. I went ahead and ended your screen share and I'm just going to highlight Deirdre. All right, I'll be highlighted relatively quickly. There you are. We're gonna move on to Captain Whit Perry. Um, before I do that though, I, I have a lot of uh, questions that were submitted ahead of time, but we also are getting some questions in on the group chat. Um, and I'm gonna ask for Jerry and then Whit, Whit when you're done, there won't be time for Quentin to look at them as while the others are speaking, if you could glance at them. And if there's a particular question uh, that you think needs to be answered live, um, at the end, when we do the question and answer, you can you can uh, bring that up then. Uh, other than that, I'll I'll go through the questions at the end. And then uh, Jessica, I'm assuming that at the very end we can uh, include all of the questions that didn't get answered, and maybe uh, if the participants uh, want to weigh in on some of them, we can put them online. Is that? Yeah, that sounds like a fantastic okay. uh, suggestion. Yeah. All right, so we're going to move on to Captain Whit Perry who uh, has been living a dual existence for a long time. He still does live a dual existence because he spends a lot of time in the 17th century. Um, but uh, Whit, I'll let you take it from here. Great, thanks T. Hi everyone, Jerry, that was, uh, that was very good, especially the end about uh, how the Mayflower story is everyone's story. And that's the way we, it's amazing how many immigrants we get on Mayflower too that tell the story just the way you did that no, they're not Mayflower descendants nor did they come over on the Mayflower or even ships after that but maybe Ellis Island or some other way, some other pathway to America. And uh, what you said was really poignant. So for me, I am, having Jessica work my screen for me because uh, sometimes a little, I'm a little technologically challenged, but I'm gonna try and move along quickly here. I got some great slides and some videos that we're gonna show you. And of course, this one says it all. I'm gonna talk more about Mayflower too, certainly. Um, ship was given to America as a gift of appreciation for our help and cooperation during World War II. It was built in Brixham, England at the Stuart Upham shipyard. Here is 1957, of course, after it first came to Plymouth, the ship went down to New York City and a couple other places in 1957. It even went as far as Miami. Next. So here's a couple of shots here of the ship being built. Um, in Brixham, England. In the upper right-hand corner is the American naval architect, William Avery Baker of Hingham, Massachusetts, who was one of the earliest scholars to start working on reproductions here in America. It turned out that the founder of Plymouth Plantation, there in the lower left-hand corner, Harry Hornblower and Sir Warwick Charlton on the English side who had the idea to build a ship um, to then give to America. Um, Hornblower already had Baker working on drawings and they two got together, Charlton and Hornblower and decided to send the ship to Plymouth. Next. Of course, the arrival in Plymouth in 1957. You can see the thousands and thousands of people along the Plymouth shoreline. And you're looking at Coles Hill and the Plymouth Rock there from the other side, from Jerry's slide. And uh, some pretty important people there that also attended besides Richard Nixon, the then Senator John F. Kennedy was also in attendance. Um, this is of course what we had hoped Plymouth 
was going to look like in May of 2020 when we triumphantly brought the restored ship back to Plymouth. And um, certainly COVID put a kibosh on all of that, though we were just very, very pleased to be able to get the ship home at all. Next. We had a huge collaboration with Mystic Seaport Museum, without whom we could not have done the restoration of Mayflower II the way we were able to do it. Quentin will certainly talk more about that collaboration as well. Um, but for me, having it done at another museum with an educational mission was paramount and uh, really allowed us to keep some of the restoration in front of the public. They were able to view it. I'm sure many of you went down and saw the ship during the three years that it was at Mystic Seaport. Next. So certainly, again, a lot of the stuff I'm going to go over, Quentin's going to be able to uh, fill in some holes on as well. There's there's Quentin down in Louisiana, and we use some of his contacts as well as some new contacts for materials acquisition. Uh, of course, none of the wood uh, that we use for the ship is available at Home Depot. You can see here the live oak trees or Quercus virginiana that was so important for um, our lower floor and naval timbers down in the shape shaped belly of the ship, as well as all of our hanging and lodging knees. So uh, Quentin, Quentin's contacts came in very valuable. We had one guy in this particular trip, Quentin was over in Mississippi and Matt Barnes and I were in Louisiana renting chainsaws so we could help cut out the wood that way we wanted it cut. And then Quentin got more trees in Mississippi, got them on a truck and came over to Louisiana to check on us and uh, fantastic stuff. Great collaboration. Next slide. This goes, this shows you a little bit of uh, why we need the different shapes. Certainly for planking on the ship, we need long, straight, um, defect-free wood. But for our hanging knees and lodging knees, you can see every branch there that we then cut into a specific shape. We don't want to cut just across the grain of a very wide piece of wood, uh, thereby losing all the structural integrity of that wood. Next slide. There you can see some of the finished hanging knees in holding up Mayflower's half deck. Uh, and you can see the natural curve of the grain there. One of the changes we made, you can also see the clinch rings and the bronze drift bolts that we used, um, of course, in the 57 version of Mayflower, they were iron fastened. And what we saw was some of the knees were not actually rotten, but the iron had rusted, expanded as it rusted and more blew apart the knees rather than rotting them. So even though it was over three times as expensive, replacing all of the fasteners for the knees being non-ferrous bronze, we shouldn't have that problem happen again. And Quentin can tell you how hard it's getting to get large live oak knees. Next. This kind of series of slides here kind of, this shows the belfry in particular, but it gives a very good overview of just what we found throughout the ship. Uh, just everywhere. People ask, is there any one place that was worse than another? The answer is no. The ship after 61 years when we first undertook the discovery process and exploratory surgery as I call it at Mystic Seaport the winter of 2014-2015 where we took everything apart to really have as good an idea as we could to the scope of the project and what we were getting ourselves into which was of course important for me to be able to present a clear picture to our board of directors. I had seen too many and many of you know about all the great ideas people have to restore a ship and then they get halfway into it and realize they've opened a can of worms, had no idea what the time and expense would be and then sometimes it doesn't get finished. So we wanted to go into it with a very clear idea of what we needed. So this belfry is a good vision of what 
we found everywhere on the ship. Next. There's the new belfry. And some of you, that wood, that particular wood there, that white oak, it's, it's funny, both Quentin and I can look around anywhere on that ship. We can point to just about any piece of wood and tell you pretty closely where it came from. This, this actually, all the white oak for the belfry, we were able to get uh, that was some leftover stock from the restoration of the Coronet down in Newport, Rhode Island. So this was incredibly well seasoned wood before we made the belfry. And next. Here we have a video coming up, short video. So here we are on Mayflower 2's half deck. This is kind of where the command center is for your officers of the deck. You can see the beautiful new cast bell for Mayflower that we cast in Plymouth uh, Labor Day weekend of 2019. Generous donor Steve and Nancy Williams helped us out with that as well as many other people. We had the foundry actually brought the foundry on a truck from Ohio and cast the bell in Plymouth over the Labor Day weekend. We had veterans and children actually putting the bronze into the crucible to be melted and then cast into the sand casting that right there and then. Some of the war veterans brought buckles and some medals from many different wars from their father or from themselves and put into, melt into this bell forever. And we're gonna give it a ring now. You're gonna love this. <laughs> Great. So now we move on to the good, the bad, and the ugly. And this slide kind of shows you the ugly. This is the very lowest part of the hold of the ship. After we had um, taken out 130 tons of ballast and as well as concrete that was poured between the futtocks there. And you can see here um, quite a lot going on. It's rot. They have the keelson, a lot of piece of the keelson out. Next, I'm doing this kind of in a series, starting with that, that ugliest slide in the hold. Then we come here as we're just getting started, and here's one of the floor timbers going into the ship, and I'm pretty sure that <clears throat> these guys are asking themselves, how are we going to get this in place, this 400-pound, four or 500-pound timber without getting it on our feet? And uh, Louie... They did a great job. It was really good, again, with the educational part of our mission. You have Tucker there working with Louie. Louie's a graduate from the International Yacht Restoration School in Newport. And it was gratifying for me to see so many uh, older, more senior shipwrights at Mystic Seaport under Quentin's tutelage that were able to pass along some of the knowledge, skills, and abilities uh, of this type of ship craftsmanship that is just as important to keep alive these skills as it is to keep alive the ship itself. Next. This is a little bit, little bit later on. You can really see the difference in color here between the old and the new. And of course, down low here, it's pretty much new because I knew that we had to make very, very tough decisions down low here, knowing that we wanted the ship and this restoration to be able to, with regular and routine maintenance, last another 60 years. And uh, so down low, I did not, I knew I could not go back to my board of directors in 10 years and say, oh, we should have, we should have replaced that naval timber number 10. Ooh. Next. And then here is the finished hold um, before we put the sole in and before all the ballast and everything else and whatnot went back in. But the curves of the Mayflower from the bow looking to the stern, anyone who loves wooden boats has to say that's a pretty sexy picture. Next. Ah, okay, another video here. You got a couple more feet, right? Clear? Yeah. All right, now let's go aft. Right. 
there. These planks are two and a half inches thick and a lot of them over 30, 35 feet long. They're in the steam box for uh, about an hour per inch and they got about 20 minutes and it clamped in place while it's pliable before it starts to harden up again. Next, here we are again. This is the new main mast on Mystic Seaport's lathe. I'm sure most of um, people that are here today watching have been to Mystic Seaport and know this lathe. There's Dean. So right there, we have the main mast. That's a 72 foot spar, Douglas fir, that's on the lathe. And uh, you can see that we did use a laminated piece for the new spar on Mayflower. Um, there's been too much trouble over the last 10, 15 years with brand new full one piece trees, checking with two larger checks and being condemned very, very quickly. And again, with my accountants, there's no way I was going back to them in five or six years and saying, oh, we need another new main mast. Next. Here it is turned and we have the Waldings on now. Of course, uh, we had master rigger Matthew Otto um, working on the rig the whole time. And one of my crew members was able to work with Matt over a whole five year period to uh, learn from him as they're doing it. He's actually downstairs in my shop today, helping up here in Plymouth, helping us down rig. Next. Here's another video with the lathe in action. Tell you about that. As with the ship, where about 70% of the ship at this time is brand new. Um, that's about the same or more with the rigging. You can see here for our uh, Martinet, uh, Martinet's here. The dead eyes are the original English elm that we were able to save. But of course, all the uh, standing and running rigging itself is new. And it's, again, just very gratifying to see that these arts are kept alive through these replica restorations. Next. Just another shot of the, the beautiful detail work um, for the collar up on the top mass and with all our shrouds there. Um, the material itself is synthetic, but as you can see, it looks, looks pretty authentic. Next. And there's Sarah and Don putting on the main course last, about a year ago, I guess, about a year ago. The sails themselves are also synthetic. Next. Here's some of the detail work for the sail work. Uh, again, Oceanus cloth rather than linen. In the past, we were not able to leave the sails on Mayflower. And you would always have the people at the dock when it's in museum mode rather than uh, operational mode asking, well, where are the sails? How does that work? And it's very hard to explain that linen, if left on the sails, would rot in two or three months. So they were always taken off. So at this point, with the new Oceanus sails, uh, thank you to Dale Ward at Traditional Rigging in Appleton, Maine. And Ullman sales in Deltaville, Virginia for our sales. We're now able to leave the sales on uh, so that we can actually set some sales at the dock. We can have put, put the braces and sheets and tacks and things into kids and adults hands so that they can actually work the sales and see how things work on the ship. Next. And here we are. September 7th of 2019, launching Mayflower after what was at this point a full three years at Mystic Seaport Museum. Um, and thanks to Quentin and Walt 
and everyone else. We actually were on schedule and went in the water when we said we were going to go in the water. And next, again, a great, great launch day, September 2019. Um, it was funny before, before we started this restoration, we were running the bilge pumps nine times a day. Now I had just been hired to kind of direct this restoration in 2014 and, and kind of a little stressed out when we were running the pumps nine times a day. After the ship went back in the water and continuing today with the bilge log, we, are, we run, the, run the pumps maybe once or twice a month. And it's mostly some nuisance water and still, unfortunately, some fresh water getting in from just being open to the public and having everything opened up. Next. Off we went, uh, leaving Mystic, hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, the ship just looked fantastic. We departed Mystic on July 20th of 2020. Of course, we had planned on leaving um, before in about May, May 1st, we are headed to Boston and uh, maybe next year. Next. Right from Mystic Seaport, we went down to New London, Connecticut, and we sailed the boat for 21 days straight. And I think that's the most the ship has been sailed, even combined since it got here in 1957. The ship is primarily an attraction vessel, uh, and it's had, of four years ago, over 25 million people across the decks, not only learning about pilgrim history, but learning about ships and this ship in particular. So the sea trials went extremely well out of New London. We uh, were able to sail in Fisher Island Sound, Long Island Sound, uh, before we started making our way back to Plymouth, we came in and out of New London because, of course, going up the Mystic River every day and through the bridges was a lot more stressful for our tugboat man there and Jaguar, Charlie Mitchell, who's been towing Mayflower 2 for over 20 years. Next. Very special day out in Block Island Sound was um, sailing with Eagle. Uh, we were very lucky they were on doing their training program. The captain and I talked and um, thank you very much, Mike Curdo. We had a great day out there and that was just so exciting. You can see there we've got oh, over 12 knots of wind and we just had a fantastic time out there. Next. And here we'll have our last video. Hope I'm not going over too much, Dee. <laughs> Jessica. The crew we had was fantastic. We were able to pull people from uh, just a few port. We were able to pull people from the plantation and some professionals that were called in.
one wonderfully dramatic music, wouldn't you say? And uh, here we are back in Plymouth. It was just so great to get the ship back. I also neglected to mention, as I saw in the video, I also was able to bring a bunch of my old shipmates from Jamestown, Virginia up to sail on the ship. So that was a fun part of the collaboration too. Um, I guess that's all I have. I will briefly mention that it was incredibly gratifying for us to be on the cover of um, the Historical Society's magazine this summer. Thank you to all of you. And within the last month and a half to two months, the ship was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. And Quentin's gonna talk a little bit about, more about that and uh, our philosophy there. Plenty of good questions at the end. Thank you all very much. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Dee. All right, that was uh, terrific. Thanks so much. And um, to everybody who's participating here, uh, these are going a little long, but I was, um, I don't know, I just think these are so uh, impressive and compelling that I'm not shutting anybody down or shortening anybody's presentation. And if you have to go, uh, our apologies, but it is being recorded and uh, hopefully um, we can, we can, you can catch up with it later if for some reason you have to, to leave on this um, terrible weather day. I'm going to quick go to Quentin, um, Quentin Seneker, who's the shipyard director at the at Mystic Seaport Museum, who with Whit Perry uh, directed the restoration over many years, and he's going to uh, enlighten us about that experience. Quentin. Wish I could enlighten you, but how, however, uh, it's kind of a tough act to follow. The two previous <laughs> presentations are really great. I'm going to go uh, see if I can share my screen here and make this work. So share screen. Let's see. We had this working before, Jessica. What am I doing wrong? There you go. All right. So I thought I'd start with just a little review of uh, Mystic Seaport's capabilities and how that relates to uh, the Mayflower's restoration and our success. Uh, essentially, Mystic Seaport's been doing this kind of work since the mid thirties, uh, really amped up in the forties and then in the early seventies actually built the shipyard with the ship lift capability to get the larger vessels out of the water. In 07, we had to replace that original ship lift with a synchro lift, which gave us uh, multiple workstations for large vessels. So uh, just prior to beginning the Mayflower, we had restored the Charles W. Morgan, 1841 National Historic Landmark uh, whaling vessel, and then took her sailing. So we launched her uh, in July 13 and then sailed her in 14. Now we began talking with uh, Plymouth, actually as early as the 1980s, about using our facility to, uh, come on, Supposed to advance the slides here. Sorry. Well, oh, you, in any case, uh, there we go. Oh, there you do. You got it. Yeah. Uh, just got to push harder. <laughs> <laughs> the um, in the eighties, she needed some work. She needed some deck work and things like that. And uh, we began talking with Plymouth, and uh, I guess two predecessors before Wit about bringing her to Mystic, but it was just too long a trip to tow the vessel that far. Uh, but that's when we began a relationship uh, talking about our involvement with preservation of the vessel. We um, actually supplied some live oak knees from our first gathering of live oak after uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, Hurricane Hugo actually, and um, it was used for small boat work. But um, then uh, we started talking about the, the big job in 2011. Now, this is an image, you know, of what we got going on right now. Uh, the vessel in the center is the Shenandoah from Martha's Vineyard. She's up for a winter's worth of work. And then to the right is uh, the schooner pilot. She's also up now, this picture is about three weeks old, uh, but the two of them side by side with uh, a lot of people that were involved with the Mayflower project still engaged in the work. Again, just to talk about the collaboration a little bit more. Uh, it was really fantastic having Wit as a full-time resident representative uh, for the ownership and uh, our crew working with his crew. We had three and sometimes uh, more full-time staff working side by side, indistinguishable from Mystic Seaport staff 
on the project. And then once the vessel was launched and rigged, uh, and I think four of our crew went on the sea trials. And as we speak, there are a couple of our people up there now uh, helping with the down rig for the winter. So the collaboration continues. Uh, we expect that uh, two years from now, when her next haul out is due for Coast Guard inspections, uh, that she'll be back for a winter worth of, uh, first of all, haul out. We don't expect it to last all winter. It'll just be a couple, maybe a month, a couple of weeks to uh, do some spot caulking, repaint the bottom. And then uh, there will be some, inevitably, there's always some recaulking needs to happen on the top sides as the wood uh, dries and becomes accustomed to being one unit instead of just different pieces of wood. So again, the collaboration was really important educationally and for us personally. Also it took a lot of burden off of us, uh, off of me personally to have wit involved in material acquisition and there to make decisions on a daily basis. It really made it uh, more of a joy. Uh, sometimes, uh, certainly there are challenges. We'll talk about them as we go on, but uh, the collaboration and the continuing collaboration, I think is really an important part of the success of the project. So again, I, I'd like to talk about the, uh, you use the same slide you saw earlier. Um, you got Baker up on the, the upper right there. Uh, the nature of the vessel as a historic vessel into itself. Now, the whole concept of recreations of historic ships uh, we're kind of used to today. Uh, but in the 50s, it was really a novel idea. And uh, Baker was a real uh, powerhouse behind that whole effort. You know, he was a full-time surface uh, naval architect, taught at MIT, but his hobby was earlier craft, especially uh, craft of this era. So he was an ideal choice for the design of the vessel. And when you consider the historic significance of a ship or any artifact or, or even buildings, you consider the people with whom uh, the vessel has been involved. You know, Baker was a master of his trade, uh, an expert in the field. So he contributes to its historic, historic significance. Upham, one of the last uh, builders in the UK, uh, familiar with large timber wood construction, Again, a master of, of his trade. Uh, Alan Villiers is captain of the vessel, uh, unbelievably important personality in ship preservation. So that contributes to the uh, historic importance of the ship as well. But, uh, you know, we've had, when we first started the project, as a matter of fact, I was appalled at one of the comments I got at our uh, Maritime Heritage Conference down in New Orleans a couple of years ago, Whit and I were both in attendance. Uh, somebody in our field, who's known in our field, when we talked about the restoration, uh, he was uh, blunt enough to say we should burn it because it's not accurate. <laughs> you know, it was really pretty offensive, uh, especially for, from somebody in the field. But, you know, I, I was reviewing, uh, Baker wrote a great book called, I don't know if you can see it here, but it's uh, The New Mayflower, Her Design and Construction. He talks about the research that he did, and it was exhaustive. Uh, remember, in the 1950s, it was much more difficult to access archives than it is today. Today, we've got access to all kinds of things uh, virtually, um, and things are much better cataloged in institutions that house artifacts and archives. But Baker was kind of blazing new ground when he was researching those archives in order to build a, a, a real ship. And he knowingly made compromises to what he found to be uh, historic construction methods. And I found a, a quote in that book that says uh, that the design is based on the best available data tempered with the necessary, where necessary by modern engineering. And in that specifically is the methods of construction and framing. You know, she's more a vessel of the latter 19th century than a vessel of the early 17th century in her construction methods. And that uh, number one was because he didn't think he could get timber the size of what would have been used in the original construction, uh, especially curved timbers, compass timbers as it were referred to, but uh, also the engineering uh, for underwriting and things like that. So basically he followed what today is uh, the ABS rules in terms of framing. Her framing would have been single fodex, single pieces of frame, 
appropriate to the curve of the ship in that specific location, and then just uh, lapped over one another. But now, the way she was built in the 50s, everything is very precisely fit in two layers, gives you much more predictable strength, and you can do it with uh, lighter scantlings. Uh, so the other big compromise he made was knowing that the vessel is going to be a museum ship uh, for modern visitors. He added about a foot of headroom in the tween decks. Uh, again, a conscious decision to accommodate its modern use. Uh, his research showed that a vessel this tonnage would probably be only in the area of about four feet of headroom in the tween decks area, but he made it a full six feet so people wouldn't get injured as they walked around down below. So all of these compromises uh, were intentional. And uh, I think that the fact that she lasted 60 years with you know, people sometimes say, well, didn't they maintain her? No, obviously not. They maintained her very well for her to last 63 years before need, needing major structural intervention. Inevitably, all ships rot. And uh, we find that on a 25 or 30 year cycle, we have to do major intervention for our large wooden vessels. So the fact that she survived intact with only partial rebuilds in various periods of time it was a real testament to the investment that Plymouth made in preserving the ship. So um, again, historic in its own nature, as Whit mentioned, just only recently recognized uh, to be part of the National Register. So uh, I think our argument is now vindicated, don't you, Whit? <laughs> so again, when we first started talking to uh, Plymouth in um, 2011, of course, the vessel is a very important part of the offering at Plymouth. And not only the offering of Plymouth Plantation, now Patuxent uh, in itself, but also to the whole community surrounding Plymouth, that it's a major draw for tourist dollars. Uh, and to, for the vessel to be absent would be a hardship. So we first approached it as if we could do it on a, a, a phase basis where she would come in the winter, we'd do as much work as we get, could, and then send her back to Plymouth, uh, come back the next year. Not only would it have taken at least six years to do it that way, it just is totally impractical because a lot of the new work that we would do in order to make her uh, fit to go back would have to be removed in order to access deeper elements of the ship's structure. Uh, it was just not practical at all. We did wind up doing it on a phase basis, but much longer phases than anybody had originally imagined. As Whit mentioned, we brought her in uh, in November of 14 uh, for sort of destructive uh, inspection. You know, we actually took quite a few planks off, opened her up in a lot of places uh, to get a good idea of what the condition was. It's terribly expensive to do so. We had to take all the ballast out of her, had a downrigger. And if we were going to do it on a seasonal basis, I mean, it's a tremendous expense. So we did do it that one season. Uh, we sent her back. Uh, and that enabled Plymouth to sort of digest the fact that we needed to replace as much of the vessel as we did. But it also gave an opportunity to fundraise and uh, handle all the public relations necessary for it not to be a great, recognized as a great hardship in the community. So. Uh, she then came back uh, for the second year, 15, the winter of 1516, again, with the intention of going back to Plymouth for that uh, summer of 16. And we decided then that the expense of taking all the ballast out, taking all of the rig down and hauling her just wasn't worth it. So we decided to work only above the water line. We rebuilt the tween decks and above in the water under that shelter you see there. Um, and that gave additional time for fundraising and uh, material acquisition. Again, we talk about challenges here. Material acquisition is probably one of the biggest challenges uh, we face in any of our projects. Because while there's plenty of wood available today, as we said, we can't get it from Home Depot. Not only that, it's more technical than that, in that these earlier vessels uh, were built with old growth material. And old growth material is much more durable, much stronger than second and you know, cultivated material. So that adds to the uh, length of time necessary to really have proper material acquisition. 
Um, and we started right from day one. I mean, how long did it take to get uh, the wood from Denmark? It was over a year and a half to actually get uh, 180 planks. You know, there's about 250 planks replaced. 100% of her planking was replaced uh, in the regime here. And uh, other material, uh, we were able to get some good long leaf pine from down south, but uh, for the bulk of the structure below the whales, it's all white oak. Uh, a lot of it, uh, Danish uh, oak planted as part of the uh, Danish Navy's uh, materials planning program uh, that uh, wind up not being used as steel and iron vessels came into dominance. So uh, some of the species that were used, you know, we've talked about white oak, which in most of the eastern part of the United States is available. We've got some from Kentucky, Berea College, some from Pennsylvania. Uh, smaller materials for framing uh, available right here in New England. We've got a lot from Connecticut and Massachusetts. Um, live oak uh, only grows below the Virginia Capes. You know, it's not a species until very recently, uh, not available on a commercial market because there's really no demand. Uh, doesn't grow straight, so nobody wants it. Uh, in most markets today, but uh, you know, because we started using it uh, salvage from hurricanes, we established a network of uh, people throughout the South that know that when trees are coming down for either uh, road building projects, developments, or in many cases, hurricanes, uh, they call us and we were able to salvage the wood. It was those contacts that enabled us to uh, acquire as much live oak as we did for this project. European oak, as I said, uh, from the Danish royal forests, longleaf pine. If there's any one species that is difficult to get in the quality and quantities that we need for uh, our shipbuilding purposes, it's longleaf pine. Uh, protected in most of its range uh, because of its important to habitat. Uh, it was the dominant forest uh, in the South uh, till the First World War. And then uh, factory building in the North, uh, shipbuilding, uh, the forests were just decimated. And uh, very little, very few stands of old growth, long leaf uh, still exist. And those that do exist are very highly valued, valued for their environment. And uh, we're only able to get it when they're either blown down by storms, uh, struck by lightning, or in some cases cut down to make fire breaks in large tracts of land. So that's probably our single biggest challenge. Uh, black oak is used for trunnels. Again, we above the waterline, we made the change from uh, steel and iron fastenings to bronze uh, to give us longer uh, lifespan, uh, indefinite lifespan, without blowing apart the uh, frames and uh, knees, as Witt pointed out. Again, a lot of the damage was not so much from rotten wood as it was from the iron expanding and blowing frame, uh, elements apart. So we used a lot of uh, black locust trunnels. The locust is available in New England pretty abundantly. Again, very little commercial value. Uh, so uh, we just got some a couple of weeks ago from uh, a road clearing project right in Noack. Uh, white ash. White ash is going through a real uh, challenge in itself right now because of the uh, boring beetles that are infesting uh, most of its range. A lot of trees are dying and uh, ash isn't a terribly durable uh, species when it's a standing tree. So uh, again, white ash is becoming more and more of a challenge. And then Douglas fir. Uh, the Doug fir in the vessel, one of the things that preserved her as long as, it, as she has been is in the 80s, uh, a new deck was put on the vessel, all old growth Douglas fir, beautiful material. And we were able to uh, retain, probably looking at the ship overall as a single element of its structure, we were able to retain the deck because it was replaced in the 80s and that keeping that deck tight also preserved the wood that was below it. Uh, for this project, uh, we had sufficient, well, Plymouth had sufficient uh, decking material left over from that project that had been well cared for. Uh, and we were able to get some uh, recycled uh, Douglas fir, uh, really beautiful quality material uh, out of Virginia where it had been stored for a long time. Uh, we used uh, some other uh, recycled longleaf, you know, taken down from factories. Uh, one large quantity of material we got had been used in a Navy pier. Uh, the trees were brought up from the down, from down south, used in a construction in Groton, Connecticut. 
uh, when the pier came down, the wood was uh, salvaged, went back down to Virginia, <laughs> and then we brought it back north to use in the project. Uh, large, old growth, excellent quality material. And again, this was part of the uh, collaboration in that it was Wit that was able to locate that material. So it was uh, um, overall probably the single biggest challenge of the project. I Wit would probably agree that material acquisition is always a real uh, challenge for any of the projects. Let's see where we go next. The other challenge we've, one of the other challenges we had in uh, the big restoration is most of the work was gonna concentrate below the waterline. So if you're gonna dismantle a ship from the waterline or you know, from the tween decks down, how are you gonna keep it from collapsing on itself? We were faced with that a little bit in the Morgan project and uh, used a similar technique, but much less uh, engineered. Um, fortunately, uh, Mayflower has gun ports. So uh, our in-house naval architect designed a skeletal structure that uh, an outfit in uh, New Hampshire actually fabricated and came in and installed. We see these large steel columns running down the side of the vessel with large I-beams transversing it right through the uh, gun ports of the ship. From there, we were able to hold up the main deck and hang the tween decks. So that passes right through the tween decks of the ship, one side to the other, and we, a series of turnbuckles and rod were able to suspend the weight of the tween decks enabling us to be pretty bold in our dismantling of the planking and framing below the tween decks. So uh, the other thing we discovered, and I think that earlier slide showed it, uh, we hauled a boat in November and by December she was covered with snow. Uh, we knew that we had to have a, a shelter on the project. And again, major investment on the part of Plymouth, uh, but enabled us to work in all weather. Um, and I think really made the work more efficient and cost effective. So here, uh, again, this is a wit that I pirated from, uh, I mean, a slide I pirated from wit. You can see the new work where it meets the old. I'd say of the roughly just under 300 buttocks that make up the ship, uh, we were probably only able to retain maybe 10 or 12%. Uh, and so you can see those just around the turn of the bilge where uh, they were submerged in salt water most of their life and that preserved them. Whereas uh, above that, it was all rotten and below that for, as we pointed out, the 60 year term, it was important that we, we uh, replace the framing there. We also, uh, in terms of species, most of what you see up to the turn of the bilge is all live oak. And then uh, above that is white oak. Uh, that is large measure due to the density of live oak and durability. Now it's easier to re replace parts of the ship that are above the waterline, but stuff as deep into the structure as this lower framing, naval timbers, floor timbers, and keelson, you don't ever want to have to look at it again in our lifetimes. You know, you want that to be durable. So, uh, and again, the weight distribution. Live oak doesn't float. Uh, its density is about 75 pounds a cubic foot. White oak is only about 54. So it makes for better weight distribution uh, throughout the structure. Um, I don't think I have any slides here to show it, but uh, there was a question I saw come up on the screen about ballast. You know, when the vessel was first built, uh, she had uh, scrap iron and uh, stone on top of the uh, concrete that was cast between the frames. Uh, but knowing that the vessel always had a, a challenge in terms of its design from a st stability perspective. Uh, we made a couple of significant changes in that we took out all the old ballast, uh, which by the time we got her was uh, Boston cobblestones and scrap pieces of uh, railroad uh, rail and uh, replaced it with lead at great expense. Uh, but uh, which charming personality enabled them to uh, get about half of that as a donation, which was a tremendous boon to the project as well. Uh, so uh, we replaced, as Whit pointed out, 130 tons of uh, original ballast with about 125, maybe just under 130 of uh, lead. We also, we did uh, pour concrete in uh, between the frames again, that helps uh, water uh, flow into collection points around the bilge so the bilge doesn't, uh, the timbers 
that would otherwise be submerged or able to uh, uh, stay relatively dry. And uh, the lime and the cement also goes a ways towards uh, preserving the wood. So uh, we followed uh, that, uh, I think it was about three and a half tons of nothing but scale, rust that came out of the vessel. Uh, so it was one of the more unpleasant jobs, but uh, I think the substitution we made gives the ship better stability and better life. So um, I think there'll be plenty to cover in questions, but uh, I just wanted to show uh, the advantage of being able to flow right from the Morgan project into the Mayflower project was obvious between able to retain the skilled staff and to uh, continue the flow of materials from our sources um, was great. We've had, we've kept busy enough uh, with projects since then. And we're looking forward to the next project at Mystic Seaboard Museum to uh, be the restoration of our 1921 fishing schooner. COVID of course is slowed that project down, but that'll be our next big project. So I think I'll stop sharing the screen here and uh, maybe we can go to questions. What do you think, Dean? Still there? Oh, Deidre, you, uh, you had moved. Yep, yep. Yeah. Just saw that. Sorry about that. Um, we're going to go to questions in a moment, but first I wanted, uh, I know Wit and Quentin, you spent uh, an awful lot of time together. Maybe you're tired of each other, but um, but I haven't had time to talk to Jerry, who did the historic part of this presentation. And so if there's any uh, conversation or questions you had for each other to ask live before we go to the questions that come came in from the people who are, are participating as uh, viewers, uh, here's your chance. <laughs> well, the one thing I, uh, that Jerry's work, first of all, to bring it all together in one succinct presentation like that, I think was a great benefit. But overall, I think it you know, really establishes firmly the iconic nature of the vessel, which further emphasizes its his historic significance. You know, we talk about Charles W. Morgan, we talk about all these other vessels. Uh, you talk to a school kid in Oklahoma, and it's Charles W. Who, uh, you know, but everybody knows the Mayflower. And so again, it just gives further credence to our uh, emphasis on its historic nature. Uh, and I agree, you know, Quentin knows how important that was to me to bring forward Mayflower II as an important vessel in the maritime community as well as the tall ship community, even though the ship does not get underway like so many um, reproductions uh, of today that have sail training programs. But I always say that it's, it's the kid that comes on Mayflower, which I did growing up in Massachusetts, of course took my field trips there, that gets that starry look in his eye and becomes the maritime historian later, becomes the sailor later on, becomes the person that supports these ships later on uh, from when they start out going on these field trips and very very pleased as both of us being maritime preservationists that whatever it takes to bring these ships forward whatever they may be so that we can preserve them for the future and again keep the knowledge skills and abilities alive both to sail and restore them and I wanted to ask Jerry, you know, what role can reproductions play to both scholarly research and the maritime community at large? And are they becoming an important tool and part of maritime history in America? Which, Jerry, if you'll answer in Q2, I'm interested in your opinions. Sure. Uh, first of all, you know, in writing the article, I got to have some great conversations with, with Quentin and, and Witt uh, at Mystic. And I think it does a couple of things. It's, it's easy for someone in a cynical way to dismiss uh, the Mayflower and others as, as reproduction vessels, so what? Well, it does several things. One, it shows the amazing passion that we have for our maritime heritage, that we would go through what was gone through to build the, the replica originally and to do this, this very significant rebuild, which will keep it afloat for years to come. Um, and, and like both of you pointed out, they become platforms 
to keep the heritage of shipbuilding crafts alive. If you didn't have these vessels, um, if you only had relics in museum cases, you wouldn't have young craftsmen learning uh, how to do these skills. And, and this is living heritage. And I don't consider this a, a, a reproduction. It's a ship in its own right. Uh, it has its own story now. It has a 60 year story of its own. Um, and this, this massive effort that joined these two organizations and hundreds of volunteers and craftsmen is an amazing story. And it's critical that we do these things. Yeah, I, I, you know, certainly um, as teaching history becomes maybe less important than it might have been a generation or so ago, uh, to have the three dimensional object that people can actually see and experience by going on board. You know, the fact that it's got a foot headroom is matters not to any modern visitor. It still gives a great sense of what it might have been like for uh, those 102 souls plus crew who uh, faced an uncertain future uh, coming across the ocean. I just, the thing I'm always reminded is how desperate life must have been ashore, either in England or uh, in the Netherlands, to be willing to get on a ship like this in those conditions and enter a completely unknown continent. Uh, you know, remarkable people for sure. I don't know, um, unless you the unless you have more you want to add, uh, Wit or Jerry, um, I'm going to go to question and answer mostly because we're we've gone long, and I don't want to disregard uh, people's particular questions. Uh, like I said before, especially for those who came in a little late, um, a number of questions were already addressed in people's presentations, so we can skip those. And then I have a few that are sort of on a similar theme. So I'll, I'll uh, sort of combine a couple of questions to make that um, more efficient. And then uh, we clearly, we have a lot of questions and so we're not gonna have time to get to them all, but we'll post them uh, online and the whole uh, presentation is being recorded and will be available uh, afterwards. Um, the Jerry, the questions that are coming in about the history of the ship are probably very long answers. So I'm gonna, uh, a lot of people had questions about their heritage and what makes you a Mayflower descendant? Right. Do you have to be a direct bloodline? Can you be married into it? Um, and um, so I don't know that there's a lot to speak to that. It, it depends on who your interpretation is, but since you spent a lot of time and you are a Mayflower descendant, um, maybe you could speak to that. So. You know, all of us have, I mean, hopefully all of us have, uh, have people in our family who, who pass on their family's traditions. Um, sometimes uh, they're oral, sometimes they're written. Um, uh, I was lucky that both my parents in their long, healthy retirement were very interested in genealogy and contacted earlier ancestors who had also been interested. But um, the, the, the simple question is, um, I happen to be a Mayflower descendant through my, my father. Um, therefore, my children are Mayflower descendants, and my sister and her children are Mayflower descendants. My wife is not a Mayflower descendant. <laughs> uh, but what we try to do is be really inclusive, and that, that it's, it's, you know, it's a big story, and we all have Mayflower stories. But as far as being a descendant, yeah, you can't marry into it. <laughs> but my wife is part of it because her children are Mayflower descendants. There you go. Exactly. Um, there's a lot of questions about the original Mayflower coming in and what happened to the original vessel. And do you know what uh, wood the original vessel would have been made from, what the sails would have been made from, um, but mostly what happened to the original Mayflower? I'm not sure which one of you can answer that question, if you know it. I'm going to start, then hand it back to Quinton. Real quickly, when, when Baker did his, his research a long time ago, the first thing he did is track down all of the ships named Mayflower at the time, because there wasn't just one. Um, and as these, these were not important ships at the time, they weren't important. And as they, uh, so that was a big part of his beginning is to narrow down which is the Mayflower we're talking about. And now Quentin knows 10 times more from there than I do. Well, the one thing I can add in there is we at Plymouth Plantation interpreted that from court documents, we know the ship went back to England and was cut up for salvage in 1624. 
There's all sorts of rumors out there that people have the timbers in their barns and whatnot. We don't have any documentation to prove or disprove any of that. So we don't at Plymouth really talk about that, but we do know the ship was cut up for salvage in 1624. And again, these merchant vessels at the time, I think Quentin would agree, they were made the last 20, 25 years. And like our tractor trailers of today, they put a half a million miles on them, whatnot, throw them away and make a new one. This was a just a basic merchant vessel of the time. Yeah, essentially they were expendable tools. Uh, you know, as Wick points out, if they lasted as long as they did, 20, 25 years, that was a good long life if, um, if they hadn't been lost at sea and much sooner. But uh, according to Baker, uh, his best guess is she was probably built around 1608. And... Uh, on uh, her captain, majority owner, Christopher Jones's death, the vessel had already uh, become pretty, uh, pretty deteriorated. Uh, as Jerry mentions, there were quite a number of vessels named Mayflower at the time. Uh, and Baker's research shows that uh, about the only real concrete evidence of her uh, dimension would be uh, her tonnage. And then sort of working backwards from tonnage Tremendous amount of work in, went into deciphering how tonnage was measured uh, in her era and then working backwards mathematically from uh, rules of design at the time. But uh, again, um, there's even some, there was, I forget how many Mayflowers there were in the Customs House records of the era, but uh, there's even uh, rumored that uh, she may have participated in the, the Spanish Armada. <laughs> But more likely, she was only built in 1608. And, and isn't there a, a pub in England that claims to be made out of uh, Mayflower timbers? I don't think it's a very legitimate claim, but I think there is a pub that claims that. Yep. Yeah, you gotta gather them all together. There's probably more than one Mayflower in, in there. <laughs> all right, I'm just gonna go with uh, two more questions. There's, there's an awful lot, and I apologize for people who, who wrote in, but we will try and address them uh, online afterwards. Um, uh, Wait, I'm going to follow. I'm going to ask you the question second because it's you, something you're probably anticipating. Is everybody kind of wants to know what the plan is going forward? Um, but for Jerry, my question is actually what, what you might weigh on this too, as as uh, an employee at the museum. But the traditional Mayflower Thanksgiving story that we all learned as you know, fifth graders that you pointed out, Jerry, is, is loaded with inaccuracies. And now there, we've uh, been making an effort to recognize those inaccuracies, in, but mostly to include the Wampanoag aspect of this story, which is not, well, here's the question. Is, it, is, it, is the Wampanoag part of the Mayflower story at all? I know that they went back and forth, or is it more of the uh, the heritage and the story that is attached to once the the Mayflower Ships Company moved ashore? Right. First of all, I think that you know, as an historian, as we all are, quite frankly, in this business, um, revisionist history is a blessing and a curse because it's easy to attack history. It's easy to say this year we hate. Um, you know, Columbus this year, we hate uh, uh, William Bradford this year, we hate um, President Lincoln. You know, it's easy to say that. It's easy to throw stones. It's much harder to look at the nuanced details of, of history. I will say this, about a year ago um, at the, um, the Pequot Museum, they had a, a, a day when they had uh, uh, colonial reenactors and then actual Native Americans um, doing a, a, a King Philip's War day. And I talked to, I, I went around interviewing several of the Native Americans because I really want to talk to them, you know, as people, not as reenactors. And they all said, you got to go talk to this guy. And I went and talked to him. And he was, he didn't want to talk to me at all. He was quite angry, in fact. Um, and he said, you're just another person that's working on the Mayflower story. He said, all you care about Indians is when we're part of the Mayflower story. The rest of the time, we are invisible, but we're still here. We have other stories. The Mayflower story is not our story, but the only time you care about us is when we're involved in the Mayflower story. And that really hit me. I mean, it really did hit me. Um, and so it's, it's important that, that places like the 
uh, uh, I keep calling it the, the, the Plymouth Plantation. And, 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 but, but it's important that they do the work that they do, that you can go and talk to people um, and hear their stories and keep their heritage alive. And the bad side of it is that we've mistreated these people all along. The good side of it is because when people come to Plymouth to see the Mayflower, and they go to Plymouth Plantation to sort of get the Mayflower experience, they're probably having their very first experience meeting authentic Native Americans who have their own ongoing story to tell. So in that respect, it's an opportunity um, to expose more people to, to these things. Um, my, my, I'll take do the final question. Um, and this goes to you, Wit, of course, is uh, now what? <laughs> I, 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 will, I will say that uh, as somebody who worked in, uh, on sailing ships myself and then who uh, went ashore and, and I'm very interested in all aspects of maritime history, my heart really broke for uh, Plymouth Patuxet and the Mayflower crew and everybody involved in that with the 400th anniversary of the crossing happening to fall in 2020. Uh, but I know, but kudos to getting the ship home and with what you've been able to do in a virtual environment. But assuming that COVID won't last forever, what is the plan going forward? Is the ship going to sail uh, ever, uh, sometimes? Well, and Yeah, and so right now we have a very positive board that with the ship being in arguably the best operational status it ever has been in, which I think Alan Villiers would, would, would agree. We made some excellent engineering decisions with Quentin as to bringing the ship more up into the 21st century in fire protection, bilge pumping, the generator, things like that. No propulsion engines on Mayflower, so we do always have a tugboat. It would be my hope that the ship is getting underway more frequently while still being able to fulfill its mission as an attraction vessel here. How's that for vague? <laughs> Next year, <laughs> like to remind you I'm running for president. <laughs> so certainly next year, we had lots of things planned this year. We had it uh, scheduled to have a big maritime festival in Boston and the USS Constitution was to get underway with us for a sail out in Bo uh, Boston Harbor. I have and I will say I have been in constant communication with Commander Benda at the Constitution and we are very much talking about what we can do when this COVID thing or a vaccine kind of settles out. So look for us doing something with the constitution in the future when we'll share that date when we're able to. We, it's very important to us to get the ship underway at least once, if twice a year for the Coast Guard inspections. The ship is a subchapter T passenger vessel and I don't know how they got away with it before I came and they lost their certification beforehand, before this restoration and that was one of the impetuses to do the complete restoration after they failed their credit dry dock was to get the ship back into compliance for her COI. Quentin and I, we were able to do that and we were able to update the COI when Quentin was talking about the ballast. We also, we were able to really have a very successful inclining experiment because of some modifications we made with weight aloft. And as Quentin said, with the weight getting lower and more spread out positively in the bilge, opened up our route. So we now have a lakes, bays, sounds, and partially protected waters route. Um, so maybe we can do some more with that. I know the board would love to recreate a 1957 photograph we have of the ship sailing past the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> And I'm on board with that. I noticed, Dean, one of the questions someone asked if it had ever go back to England. Sure, let's talk about talking to my board of directors and getting some checks written. I, I can tell you that uh, with all confidence, I would sail that ship across the Atlantic to England. And I've done it on much smaller vessels and the work that Quentin and Mystic did to the ship, I'd do it tomorrow. Um, I'm very excited about 
building up our educational programs both at the dock and I've been working with the Duxbury Bay Maritime School. They have a uh, robust opti sailing program and dinghy sailing program for kids as well as rowing shells. We're in talks with them about um, some kind of Mayflower Mariners program where the kids would come. It's great to learn about captaining your own opti dinghy, but I like to push forward the ship, shipmate, and self that we all know and how we work together as a team. And when you have 10 people pulling on the same halyard, how important it is to work with and not just think for yourself. So we'll be doing stuff at the dock and hopefully with a culmination using our shallop boat, which is being restored at Lowell's Boat Shop in Amesbury, Massachusetts. We will use the 33 foot shallop and the Mayflower and hopefully their graduation will be getting underway, getting underway every year, at least for the inspections and hopefully to show the flag a couple of other times during the year. I'll stop right there because otherwise I'm gonna go another half an hour. Oh uh, yeah, there's, a, there's, there's endless uh, conversations I could think of and, and that would be ignoring everyone else's questions. So um, I will pass this back off to Jessica in a moment but I did want to share with everybody who's on that our next seminar is scheduled for Saturday, January 23rd with author and journalist Dyke Hendrickson on his new book, New England Coast Guard Stories, Remarkable Mariners. The schedule for the first half of the 2021 uh, NMHS seminar series is on our website at seahistory.org slash seminars. Um, I'm going to pass this off to Jessica, but I really wanted to thank the three of you. Jerry, I've worked with you very recently. Uh, and uh, actually Jerry has an article in the uh, issue of Sea History that's coming out uh, basically either yesterday or Monday. Uh, so be looking for that. It's not a Mayflower story. Uh, and, but, but Quentin and Witt and Jerry, thank you so much for joining us on this rainy Saturday. And uh, I'll, send this off to Jessica and I just really enjoyed uh, seeing you all here today. Thank you. Thanks Deirdre and I just want to reiterate again uh, uh, Deirdre's comments. I really appreciate Quentin, Jerry and Witt you joining us today. I have learned so much uh, not just about the history but about what Mayflower is doing now and the restoration. Um, it's been really enlightening and I, I appreciate it. I'm sure all of our guests today feel the same way. Uh, for all of our attendees, I just want to uh, say that we will be uh, posting the video for this uh, seminar on our YouTube channel. It will probably be available Monday or Tuesday of next week, and, uh, and we'll be able to also email everybody a link directly. If you did not have your question answered and you still already have additional questions, you can always email nmhs at seahistory.org and we'll certainly do our best to get those questions answered for you. Um, again, thank you. It, I'm not quite sure where everybody else is, but like Deirdre said, it is certainly a dreary cold morning, at least in New York where I am. Uh, we do hope to see you again soon. Uh, our next seminar, as Deirdre mentioned, is in January. And uh, for anyone who has not been onto our website recently, we are in the process of moving. Um, we have a new headquarters location in Peekskill. And so next week we're probably gonna be um, buried in boxes for at least a couple of days, maybe a little bit longer. So <laughs> just be patient with us in terms of us getting out the um, you know, answers to your questions and things like that. But, uh, but we don't anticipate any long delays. And uh, Birchie, would you like to say anything else before we uh, shut the meeting down? I just wanna say how perfectly wonderful it is to uh, see everybody. And uh, I have learned so much. Uh, there's just one little tiny story. I know everybody's ready to go, but uh, we're talking about the importance of the work that you all are doing and how, how it affects young people and gets them part of the maritime heritage. And when I had first joined NMHS and the then editor Justine Alstrom and I went to Boston to, uh, to board the rows, there was a young man at the gangplank. It was my first time going on, the, on, a, on, one, on a ship. And uh, he said, and I just asked him, well, how did you get involved? He lived in Toronto and a 
they'd had a festival in Toronto and he had seen it as a little kid and boarded a ship there. And that was it, he was hooked for life. It, it, was, it totally changed his life. And you all have done so much to change the lives of so many people. I know 2020 has been a difficult year for everybody. I wish you all a very, very happy holiday, however you're going to spend it. And we are delighted to have had you here today with us. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Thank you, everybody. Happy holidays and stay safe. And we will see you soon in January. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.